Hi, my name is Evan Howard, and this is another one of our video lectures on monasticisms, old and new. Today's lecture is on Celtic monastic settlements. I suspect that some of you know something about Celtic spirituality. You've read one of those lovely Celtic blessings that uh, recite something of the Trinity above and below and behind, or um, you've read reflections on the Celtic appreciation for the immediacy of God and the ordinary in nature. Or perhaps you've even heard of soul friends, that Celtic way of establishing relationship with one another that facilitates our relationship with God. But what of specifically Celtic monasticism? Did the Irish or Scots or Welsh, or it gets a little complicated here, have their own ways of devoting themselves entirely to, and completely to God? Were there Celtic hermits like Antony of Egypt? Were there monastic communities like the Benedictines in Italy or something like that? How did the Irish monastics live? And is there anything that we have today to learn from Celtic monasticism? Well, I am here today in Clonmacnoy's Ireland to help you answer a few of those questions. Clonmacnoy's was founded by Ciaran around 548-549. As a young man, Ciaran studied at, uh, under Enda, west of here, and under Finian, uh, probably a bit north and east of here. And as is common, uh, the custom was that early monks, uh, were, when they came into the monastery, they were to bring some of their own supplies. And so Kieran uh, brought his, the family cow uh, to take with him into the monastery. The cow was anything but common, however. It supplied milk for the entire monastery. The leaders of the monastery really began to see a uh, potential in Kieran, and they encouraged him to go and to plant a monastery, uh, perhaps in the center of Ireland on the banks of the Shannon. And that is precisely um, what Kieran did. Um, he built this monastery, uh, bringing some friends with him, and uh, they founded a few wooden huts and the early church and began to build a life together. Unfortunately, in a very short period of time, within a few months, Kieran caught the plague and died um, and was unable uh, to see the fruition of his dream of building this monastic community. However, Kieran's followers um, were able to persevere. They, they endured, they followed through, and eventually uh, Clonmacnoise became one of the most influential monasteries in all of early Irish monastic history. Now, let's use this place and the story I just told you to tell us something about Celtic monasticism more generally. The only natural question to ask first is standing here in this place with these buildings is what did these monasteries look like? Well, unfortunately, the early Celtic monasteries were not made of stone. They were made of wood and wattle huts and things like that. Um, substances that didn't persevere over time. So what you're looking at when you look at these buildings is simply the structures in memory of or the structure centuries after. Some of this is the 10th to the 12th century buildings rather than the early 6th century buildings. But you still have a little sense of the archaeology, the, the layout of the land is still pretty similar. So what did these monasteries look like? If you remember the story, you can get a sense of these things. First, you have a leader. The leader has a call, go and plant a church on the banks of the Shannon. So as you saw, there was the banks of the Shannon and there is a church. Then you have initial followers and then they build buildings. The buildings um, establish themselves in a kind of a circle. 
um, there is a, a a boundary that follows around as you see and that, and that is where the monastery was built in this circle and the circle then grows into larger and larger um, a larger and larger diameter um, as the monastery itself grows. Then, out of the initial founder and the initial circle of friends in the first buildings, then what developed ultimately is a settlement. Not really a full city, but at least the development of a settlement or a small town. Um, and that's what the early monasteries in Celtic culture were. They were actually settlements. Um, where you have a church, you have the beginning of a school, you have the development of the arts, and you then uh, you have multiple functions that a, a monastery in this area um, utilize themselves for. Now that leads us to the second question: just what did the community look like in the in the monastic community? You have a wide range of people that are a part of it, and that's that's part of the the uniqueness of a Celtic monastery as opposed to like a Benedictine monastery. Although there's similarities even in that. Um, first of all, you have people who are really highly committed, um, what we would think of as the normal monk, where they are celibate, um, they're living within the innermost enclosure. Um, they're fasting, you have a very strict daily office, um, yet these are not the only people that are living within the monastic settlement. You also have people that are called um, maneg or aspende, or there's a number of terms of people who are associated with the settlement but who have not taken these kind of full vows and yet they still live within the monastic settlement. Um, these are called, uh, they, sometimes the term is penitent or seekers on the way, you know, this kind of a language. People who are taking, um, uh, they're making some of the commitment, but it's not the full commitment that the strict monks might take. Then you also have another layer of people who are living and a part of this very monastic settlement enclosure, and these are um, tenants friends, um, farmers who are helping to take care of, but are also participating in, in this settlement. If you think of a noble that owns a piece of property and you have serfs and others who are working the property who are all a part of a noble's uh, estate, you might think of a monastery as one of these estates where the, the monastic community itself, the monks, are the quote-unquote nobles. Uh, you know, you might think of a Columba or uh, a Brendan who, or, or here a Kieran, who is the original noble that, that the estate, the land is granted to them and then they lead this community um, and that you've got all kinds of people living in this. And, um, and they work the land, they pay dues, and, and partly as a result, they also have relationship. They, they can participate in the Anamkara, or the spiritual direction relationship with some of the leaders. And this leads us to our third question, the way of life. What was the way of life of early Celtic monasticism? Life was lived differently. For various people in the settlement, of course, you've got these different levels of people living there. So it's hard to say, you know, when uh, the strict monks might be living very different than the tenants and this sort of thing. Yet, I still think there are features um, that are either similar or, or distinct from other monasticism. Uh, and other Western monasticism or even Eastern monasticism. And it's that that I kind of want to draw attention to here. First... Um, there is prayer. And that's uh, monasteries are places of prayer. And indeed, you have the regular office, the different times of the day when the monks would be saying prayers um, together um, and times of private prayer. And one of the things that I think is kind of distinctive about early Celtic and Irish monasticism is the, the what's this called the saying of the 350s. It was required for all of the strict monks that in addition to their daily office, they were required to recite 
the Psalter in its entirety, three fifty, three groups of fifty Psalms each day. It was a pretty serious commitment. And the other thing um, that is normal for mon monasteries is the routine of work. And here, of course, you've got a usual farm work. Um, the rule of Colum Keel, who is another, you might know him as Columba, um, he says of manual labor, your manual labor should have a threefold division. First, fill your own needs and those of the place where you live. Secondly, do your share of your brother's work. Thirdly, help your neighbors by instruction, by writing, by making garments, and uh, providing any other need of theirs that may arise. And you see, even within the idea of work, there's this combination of self-provision, but also being a part of a settlement, uh, a small town, a village that is growing up and taking care of one another and your part in that as a monk. Another thing that in, in monasteries, you've got prayer, you have work, you have study. And um, as you can see, um, by the comments, even on instruction in writing that that Colum Keel is giving, study played in a significant part of early Celtic monastic life. Clomac Noise here um, was very influential and well known as a center of scholarship. And this follows the whole pattern of Druid education. We can't get into all of that here. Another thing that monasteries are involved in as service, and again you hear this idea of providing service to those around you, needs uh, material and spiritual, um, uh, and also beginning as to be a center from which mission would grow and providing the spiritual needs of others uh, around you. Celtic mon monasticism is well known for its idea of mission. You have Brendan who travels out to the sea, you have Columba, and then later on Columbanus who begins to go back to Europe and founds monasteries and re-reaches uh, France and even Germany uh, through Boniface and others. It becomes a very, very missionary movement in uh, the history of the Christian Church. Another thing that is common to monastic life that you will see um, distinctly pr practiced in I Irish or early Celtic monasticism is asceticism. The uh, question is, is it, you, you read the literature and there's a lot of discussion about some very severe treatments, standing in the water for hours um, in cold water with your arms out like this, uh, outstretched. Um, and that's the, it's a very uh, severe kind of thing. Well, the question is, is it severe or not? And Catherine Tom writes, all the practices were designed to promote personal growth in the spiritual life and were not primarily focused on punishment. The injunctions of the rules make it clear that their asceticism was through prayer or sacrifices or work and mortification to aid in the transforming of the energy of self-denial into a spiritual power. The asceticism thus recommended in these primary sources of the 6th to 8th century Irish monasticism was not harsh or inhuman because the idea, the radicality of their lives depended on the fact that it was deliberately chosen. They wanted to devote themselves wholeheartedly to Christ and they gave themselves up thoroughly for this. They were captured by the beauty of their newly found faith in the Christian God incarnated in Jesus, um, whose life they contemplated in the daily recitation of the canonical hours, and whose presence surrounded them in the totality of the creation. See, so you get the idea, I mean, early Celtic literature, even before Christianity, had a lot to do with these heroes who were um, severely controlled themselves and devoted themselves, and they became warriors or whatever. These are warriors um, for Jesus, you know, the brave hearts or, you know, things like that for Christ, the early heroes of the faith who went to extremes to, to find relationship with God. Finally, I want to say something about um, Celtic monastic influence. Celtic monasticism was indeed very influential through Columbanus later on, traveling to Europe. Um, you'll find uh, their book, um, 
Oh, what the Thomas Cahill, How the Irish Saved Civilization. You'll find a story about how the Irish monks were involved in persevering and preserving the Christian faith that later comes to Europe and, and brings civilization back. I think personally, I see, as I have studied and as I've traveled here throughout Ireland, um, a few things that I want to mention by way of enduring values that I see in early Celtic monasticism. Number one is the value of aggression. Uh, the, again, the Celtic hero, the person who, who goes out on the edge. Geographically, you have Brendan taking the long voyage. You have others um, going out to the islands and, and living in like um, Skellig Michael or some of these really remote islands persevering. Or um, Kevin's bed, this little cave of three and a half by three and a half by seven. And they, they move into these places out on the edge where you, where you find God, you know, at your very own edge. And devotionally on the edge, saying the 350s every day, ascetically, prayers in the cold water, the cross vigils where you're standing with your arms out open. Maybe where's our edge? Maybe we need to find edges today in the development of a new monasticism, where we're moving into inner cities, where we ourselves find, our, uh, find those remote places, those uh, lifestyles and, and locations and habits where we can persevere on the edge and find a relationship with God. The value of women leaders, that's uh, the second value I want to mention. And when I've studied the early Celtic, you'll find people like um, Bridget or Manin or Hild, Hilda um, in the ancient, who ended up founding monasteries and developing monasteries of both men and women. Um, and then in my visits here in Ireland, I visit women like Bernadette Flanagan or Sister Phil of the Solas of Rida. Um, they remind me of these women prophets, the, the widows of the New Testament, people, um, women who were courageous in moving the gospel forward. And I see the same thing happening today, and I think it needs to happen today. A third value is the value of nebulous boundaries. In, in early Celtic monasticism, the boundaries, even the geographic boundaries, you know, where is in and out of the monastery? The walls are not there to, to isolate yourselves, but rather you have this nebulous Celtic monastic settlement. Um, you have the, it's a church, it's a monastery, it's a town, it's all of the above. Um, your bishop is, could be a bishop, could be an abbess or abbot, could be a noble, it, it's all of the above. There's these blended boundaries, earth and the thin places that move you into the spirit. Um, there are some value in early Celtic monasticism of these nebulous boundaries. And I have a feeling in a time of transition, in a places of transition that we are living today, that we need to keep our boundaries and make them with dotted lines. They may not be what we think they are. Number four, the value of the relationship to the earth. Uh, you have probably heard in the background the voices of birds. Kevin was famous for his relationship to the birds. There is the legend of birds building a nest on his arms outstretched and building a nest there and, and, and hatching eggs. There is the story of Kieran, I've already mentioned, and the cow. Um, everywhere you find the blessings in Celtic of the daily, the ordinary nature. Again and again and again, you'll see this idea of a thin place between nature and the spirit. And even the people I have talked to here in Ireland um, in this uh, trip I've taken uh, studying early Celtic monasticism, it is nature. Um, you'll find that Father uh, Michael Rogers and his sensitivity to nature. The women of Solas Vrida and their a, a sensitivity to make an ecologically sensitive, even just the building itself where I visited, very conscious of that. So the value of relationship to the earth. Finally, I want to say something about change. If there is anything 
that you see in the history of Celtic monasticism, it is change. This very place was attacked by fire, Viking raids, Norman raids, Irish raids, British raids, change after change after change. And they rebuilt and they rebuilt and they reformed and it goes from wood to rock and from rock to, to other kinds of things. And over time you have pot Protestant faith, you have penal laws against the Catholic Church, you have secularization. Change is normal. And we've got to remember that. It just takes place. And because of that, monastic life has to have the courage to change, to adapt, to rebuild. My question today then is, are we, are we Christians going to have the courage to form new communities, to form new ways, new forms of monastic living that can adapt to the culture and the time that we have? to be adapting to the change that's taking place right here and now. I think there is a lot that we have to learn from early Celtic monasticism. And I hope that in doing so, that you have a wonderful day.